Welcome to the Why Did I Get Cancer podcast. I'm Deborah Herlax Enos, a small town girl turned TV nutritionist and healthy living expert. I design health programs for the average guy or gal, including those average guys named Metallica. On September 1st, 2020, I was diagnosed with breast cancer. I asked every oncologist the same question, why did I get cancer? But none of my doctors had good answers for me. I wanted answers and that's why I started this podcast. I wanna help you to lower your cancer risk and provide self-care tips for those in the battle. I'm getting answers and I wanna share them with you. What did I take away from today's episode? That in newly diagnosed breast cancer cases, up to 30% of the women with breast cancer had some sort of major trauma in their lives. And in stage four breast cancer, up to 80% of these women had some sort of unresolved trauma in their life. And according to Dr. Jen, whatever we can do to reconcile trauma that we've been through will pay off in huge dividends in protection against cancer. I'm so excited to talk to today's guest, Dr. Jen Simmons. And, you know, I was just scrolling through Instagram and I saw some of your amazing, and I'll say just kind of sassy and fun videos. And I just, I started binging. I never knew how you, how we connected. (laughs) Well, one of them, um, all I can say is you were wearing this beautiful green dress and you were talking about breast cancer and that the number one question you get from your patients is why did I get breast cancer? And of course that's the name of my, my podcast is why did I get cancer? So I immediately just kind of glommed on to you. So welcome to Why Did I Get Cancer? Thank you. I'm so happy to be here and so happy to make the connection and um, finding great solace in the fact that good things can come from Instagram. (laughs) Isn't that a lovely thing to say? Because sometimes it's a blessing and a curse. (laughs) Yeah, for sure. For sure. But like anything else in life, right? That is so true. um, And we have to find our blessings where we're looking. Yes, I love that. You're right. You're right. And turn our pain into purpose, whatever that pain happens to be. And that leads me to a little bit about you. So you have, is it 17 years as a breast cancer surgeon? Yeah. So it's a pretty interesting backstory. Um, I more or less was born into a breast cancer family where the vast majority of the women in my family, despite the fact that we are not carriers of the BRCA gene, the vast majority of women in my family die of breast cancer. And in particular, I had a first cousin. Her name was Linda Creed. She was a singer-songwriter in the 1970s and 1980s. She wrote all the hits for the spinners and the stylistics. Her most famous song was The Greatest Love of All. She actually wrote that in 1977. She wrote that as the title track to the movie, The Greatest, which starred Muhammad Ali. But Whitney Houston re-released that song in April of 1986. And at that time, it spent 14 weeks as the number one song on the chart. I remember. Oh my gosh. It's the greatest love of all. I mean, it's epic. It's iconic. And Linda would never know that because she died of breast cancer that month. So at 36 years old, when I was 16, my hero, the, the like shining star of our family, she was actually a rock star, right? I mean, she was, she was literally and figuratively a rock star. So the shining star of our family then dies of breast cancer. And so my entire childhood is filled with breast cancer, just filled. I'm 16. And all I know is that breast cancer happens to everyone, especially young people, And young people die of breast cancer. I mean, this is the lesson that I learned in my childhood, right? And so I did the only thing that I knew how to do because I never wanted another family, another woman, another circumstance to be like our circumstance. And so I become a breast surgeon. And I spend 17 years literally at the top of my field. And I'm doing innovative things. And I really think I'm making a great contribution. And I'm working full time. 
and I'm running the cancer program for my hospital and I'm trying to make a marriage work and I'm a mother and I'm an athlete and I'm a philanthropist and, 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 and what happens? My health crashes and I get diagnosed with Graves' disease and I'm sitting in the office of my friend, colleague, doctor, and he's telling me because Graves' disease is treated just like cancer, that I need surgery and radiation and chemotherapy and lifelong hormone replacement. Really? I don't, I don't know much about Graves' disease. Yeah. It's not a good one to get. And I'm sitting there listening and it's like, I'm, I'm hearing Charlie Brown's teacher, right? It's wah, 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 wah. Like I'm having this out of body experience because these are the very words that I say to everyone every day without hesitation, without reservation. And yet when they're coming at me, I know that there has to be something more. And so I went on my own journey selfishly to heal myself. This wasn't about helping the world. I thought I was helping the world. I thought I was doing the right thing. I wasn't overweight. And so I thought I was healthy. I was a doctor. And so I thought I knew about nutrition and nourishment. And fast forward five years later, as I've trained in functional medicine, become certified in functional medicine, I know that our traditional medical system is so very broken, so broken. There are some wonderful, amazing, innovative parts of it, but this acute care system that we have developed over the years cannot treat chronic disease, does not treat chronic disease. All it does is delay, 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 delay. And in the interim, those people that are being delayed they're not getting healthier. They're getting sick. They're not. They're not because mm-hmm. they're not hearing that they need to sleep, have, you know, protect their sleep, protect your peace. Of course. Eat, a, eat more plant-based diet, eat more, you know, grass-fed meats. I mean, just they're not hearing that message. Eat real food. Right. Move your body. Sleep at night. Stay off your devices. Live within the rhythm of the sun, love deeply, and live purposefully. Right. How many people are doing that? And if you look at Blue Zones, which I'm sure you're familiar, um, Blue Zones, just for our listeners, it's these, I think, seven places in the world where people live to be 100, but they're not a, living, you know, they're not a, over 100. They're not, they're not in rest homes. They're out there gardening. They're dancing. They're playing cards with friends. And one of, one of the things that I love the most about Blue Zones is they say, if you wake up every day with a purpose, that can add seven great years to your life, not just seven years in a nursing home. Yeah. So remember in the Blue Zones, each generation has their purpose. And in our society, youth is valued. In their society, age and wisdom are valued. And that is why they have the longevity that they have by and large. Now, they also, they don't eat Doritos. (laughs) They don't. They don't. (laughs) They don't eat junk food. Right. They don't stop at 7-Eleven for dinner. They don't. Um, But their elders have a real and important purpose in their society. And so they have a reason to live to tomorrow because they're needed. That's right. They have a purpose. They have a very valued and honored purpose. And so um, we, we do not have that in our society. Our elders are not valued. Our elders are not utilized for their wisdom. They are basically cast aside. We send them to, we send them to a home. And it's, it's very, very sad. We've lost multi-generational living. We've lost multi-generational wisdom. We farm out the raising of our children to others instead of keeping it within your home. And as a result, I mean, look what happens. We, by and large, our, our older years 
are spent miserably chasing one diagnosis after another without purpose, without joy, without happiness, without fulfillment. No wonder we get cancer. No wonder we get cancer. And as a functional medicine physician, can you talk a little bit about the the root cause? I, I saw one of your videos a couple of days ago that, you know, your job and your calling as a, as a functional medicine physician is to not just say, okay, you need this surgery and you need these drugs. Not that there's not a place for those because I had surgery and I had drugs <laughs> during my breast cancer journey. But my cry to every oncologist that I saw is, why did I get cancer? I'm a certified nutritionist. I've been in this field for 32 years. I eat organic. I eat non-GMO. I run half marathons. I don't have the BRCA gene. There, in fact, we have almost zero cancer history in our family. Why did I get cancer? And nobody had a nobody had an explanation for me. So first, let me say that you, you're never going to get the answer that you're looking for from a traditional oncologist because they're never going to spend the time looking through to see, to answer that question for you. And one of the first things that we learn as a functional medicine doctor is to listen. Because oftentimes, if you spend enough time with someone and you help them unpack what's been happening to them this year, last year, the year before, five years before, you come up with that answer. You often know. Um, There's an interesting statistic that of of women who were recently diagnosed with breast cancer, if you look at early breast cancers, up to 30% of those will have had trauma in their their lifetime. And when we look at people who are diagnosed with metastatic breast cancer, so stage four breast cancer, 80 some percent of them will have had trauma in their life. 80%. This is not a coincidence. It's not a coincidence. And so unless we reconcile that trauma, unless we do something differently, unless we deal with it, it's going to manifest. It has to go somewhere. Go somewhere. Just like the heavy metals that are in our atmosphere, they don't just come in and pass through us. They have to go somewhere. So they go and take residence in our bones. And we have a horrible osteoporosis problem. Why do we have a horrible osteoporosis problem? Well, first of all, we don't move as much as we can. But second of all, we have toxins that are being being deposited into our bones. So if you have toxins there, you can't have the substrate that you need there. This all makes so much sense. But you're right. This is not what we're going to hear from a traditional you know, I guess I would say traditional Western medicine. I mean, occasionally you might get a physician who says, hey, look at what you're eating, you know, make sure you're eating organic, you know, make sure, maybe add more plants to your diet, um, get an air purifier. But I still have to say, even, you know, being in this field for 30 plus years, I never hear that. If you heard that from your physician, then I would actually like to call them and thank them. Yeah. You well, know? sadly, I did yeah. not. But I hear it a lot on my podcast you know. when I talk to people of like course. you. Right. But, right. you know, and listen, more and more people are becoming woke. Like, I am probably 10 years ahead of the curve. And my colleagues who right now think I'm crazy. I couldn't agree more. Right? Like the people that sat across the table from me and listened and hung on to every word that I said for 20 years now think I've lost my mind. And that's okay. Of course they do. That's okay. This it's Losing your mind like this is a really good thing. Yeah. And what I say is like, well, maybe I lost that mind, but I found this one. That's right. This one's better. This one is better because at the end of the day, this is what, what you're talking about is the way we lived 200, 300 years ago. Wake up with the sun, right. go to bed right. after the More sunset. That, right. 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 Quit eating all the way up until bedtime. Turn off the news. And then the lights from our devices can just absolutely wreck your sleep. And I have so many clients who say, I I can't sleep. And I say, well, what do you do? You know, you can't, you wake up at two o'clock in the morning. Oh, I get on my phone and I read, you know, like, well, that's a problem. Because as soon as your eyeballs see that light, it says, oh my gosh, I'm going to start making cortisol. And wake this person up because it's actually sunrise. Yeah. So we we forget that, like, despite the fact that we are living in modern times, we're living on a very old gene code. 
our genes have not changed. Our environment has changed, but our genes have not changed. And so we need to, all of us, whether you have cancer or you don't have cancer, we all need to realign ourselves with the rhythm of the sun. We all need to realign ourselves with circadian rhythm. My son will probably hate me for saying this, but um, from a genetic standpoint, like we all have a proclivity for weight gain, all of us. And my son during sports season is in phenomenal shape. And then in the off season, when he eats like he's still playing football, but he's not playing football six days a week, he tends to gain weight. And he said to me, how do I lose weight? And I said, just stop eating after dark. Our metabolism shuts down when the sun goes down. We are not meant to eat after dark. Why? Because if you ate after dark, you got eaten by a saber-toothed tiger. <laughs> when the sun went down, you had to go safely into that cave. That's right. That's right. And, and there wasn't light so that you could read. So you went in back into your cave and you went to sleep allowing your digestion to work on the food that you had eaten four hours before. But you don't eat all the way up until bed. And I will say that um, before I got diagnosed with breast cancer on September 1st of 2020, I had previously been diagnosed with GERD and Barrett's esophagus because I was eating all the way up until I went to bed. You know, and I would, and of course, as a nutritionist and having a practice for 30 years, my practice was all about weight loss, weight loss, weight loss. It, it was about health, but most of my client, clients came to me for, about weight loss. So yes, so popcorn before bed, wonderful snack, but not so great if you're trying to digest and go to bed within the next 20 minutes. Absolutely not. And quite frankly, I mean, when we look at all the information that ties breast cancer and insulin and insulin-like growth factor and cortisol together, grains are probably not, you know, we've only been eating grains since the agriculture revolution. Like we are really not grain eaters. And so grains are probably not the right dietary item for people who are dealing with a cancer diagnosis to eat. Now, there's going to be exceptions and some people are going to be fine with them. But in my patient population, for the most part, I recommend people not eat grains. And if they insist on eating grains, I make them wear a continuous glucose monitor to make sure that it is okay for them. Hmm. Can you tell us a little bit about, you know, insulin spikes and perhaps the link there to not just breast cancer, but I'm assuming all types of cancer? Uh, most types of cancer, not all cancers are tied to um, insulin levels, but most endothelial cancers. So cancers that uh, of the lining of ducts. So things like breast cancer, prostate cancer, colon cancer, ovarian cancer, they all, they all share this same kind of basis. And insulin is a growth factor. I mean, it is a storage hormone. It teaches, it tells our, it tells our body to store fat, to make fat cells. And it, and its intention is growth. Why? Because we, from an evolutionary standpoint, had times where there was great food availability, right? We had times of harvest and we had times of great scarcity where there was no food around, so from an evolutionary standpoint, and we should tie fasting into this conversation, we are meant to function as well in a fed state as in a fasted state. But the, but the people who survived the famine were the people that were able to gain right weight when food was plentiful. So it wasn't people with terribly good metabolisms. It was the people who were able to store as fat that we're able to get through the long periods of starvation. So just from a selection standpoint, it, were, it is people who are able to gain weight that were able to survive through those times. So good fat stores were the ones who survived. Yes. Okay, that, yes. makes, that makes perfect sense to me. Right? So the, the way that we tell our body to make fat is that we raise insulin levels. We raise insulin levels in accordance to how much glucose we have coming in or how much blood sugar we have coming in. And so as those insulin 
levels rise, you're telling your body to grow, 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 grow. Well, guess what happens? If you continue to send the grow signal, eventually it's going to start to grow out of control. That's what cancer is. Oh my gosh. I love, this is, this is an actual, actually it's a simple explanation and I don't think I've ever heard it quite like this before. I mean, obviously this is overly simplified, but that's okay. I like overly simplified. There, there are more growth factors other than insulin, but insulin is probably the major one. And you know, there have to be other things. We, we look at C-reactive protein to look at infl- inflammation levels. And the combination of high insulin and high CRP is a recipe for cancer. Okay. So it sounds like just to break this down for our listeners and for myself, cutting back on sh- added sugars, grains, um, muffins, you know, cookies, tortillas. Anything that's made from processed grains. So anything that's made from flour, because once you, once you take the grain from its original structure, and I'm not talking about whole wheat flour, like whole wheat flour is flour. So once the grain isn't whole anymore, it is immediately available as sugar. If your body doesn't have to work to break it down, it's immediately available as sugar. So eating a piece of bread, whether it be whole wheat bread or whatever, eating a piece of bread is equal to having a tablespoon of sugar. It does the exact same thing the second it hits your bloodstream. Okay, and so, you know, you'd think a piece of toast is innocuous. And it takes nothing for your body break that down. It takes nothing for your body to break that down. So so what you're saying is having a piece of toast, you know, you get up in the morning and you have a piece of toast or a bagel, it takes nothing for your body to break that down. So it basically becomes fuel for cells that could be cancerous. So what it's going to do is it's going to spike your insulin levels. And that's something that's very easy to measure. And when you're, when your insulin levels are up, that's the signal. Go and grow. Oh my gosh, go and grow. And I don't, I don't know about you, but for me to make dietary changes or any kind of change in my life, I need to know the why. And I think you've just broken that down in such a way that that why is so strong for me now. I mean, I will think about that every time I, you know, walk in the door after a long day and I think, I don't feel like cooking. So I'm just going to have a a piece of toast for dinner or a handful of popcorn. Yeah. So I, and listen, I've grappled with this and I had to do my own healing and, um, and I, I live this way. I live by example, and I would never tell other people to do things that I'm not willing to do myself. Um, And I've just reframed like, okay, if I'm exhausted and I don't feel like cooking dinner, that's the night that I'm going to have a handful of pistachios or two handfuls of pistachios, or I'm going to cut an avocado in half and put some Uh, everything basil seasoning on it and eat the avocado. And so those things couldn't, couldn't be any easier, right? Those are things that you can easily keep in your house. And, and that's, and that, listen, I'm a working mother, like everyone else that happens plenty of times, plenty of times. And, and it, and so it's just a, it's a mental shift because I think that, you know, toast, there's my toaster. I've got some, you know, bread in the freezer, pop it in there. Maybe I'll throw, you know, a little peanut butter on it, or just have a piece of toast with lots of, you know, grass, grass fed butter uh, in it, on it. And I just need to shift my thinking that, okay, I'm just going to have a couple handfuls of almonds or pistachios. And it's honestly, it's going to take longer to eat. So it's going to be much more satisfying because when we are shoving food in quickly and chewing, it, we never really get the signal that, hey, this was good. I'm getting full. But you know, having to open yeah, pistachios out of the shell, that might take half an hour. And it's going to be very satisfying mm-hmm. and keep your body mm-hmm. from going insulin crazy 
with just having a piece of toast for dinner. Well, the other thing is that pistachios and most nuts will not spike right. your insulin. Because of the protein and fat content. That's exactly right. And so now eating too much protein, like if you have a big steak, that is going to spike your insulin levels. Because once we have gotten the amount of protein that we need, we convert the rest of it to sugar. And I think most of those people, you know, I, I've had so many patients who come to me and they're like, I don't eat any sugar. And they're on these heavy, heavy, heavy meat-based diets. Guess what? It's the same thing because too much protein is just going to be converted to glucose. Okay. Well, that is really interesting. And I don't think that I have heard that before. And I certainly don't have the realization of that. And I grew up on a farm. And so meat what meat and potatoes, that's that was what was for dinner five nights a week. And you, know, you think of these carnivore diets now and um, you know, just the very protein heavy. But it sounds like what you're also saying is how do you feel after you eat? Is that a question we should be asking ourselves? Absolutely. I think we we have gotten to such a place, we, we're in such a culture of convenience, we're eating on the run. So rarely are people sitting down at a table and doing nothing but eating their food, right? So eating with intention is something that almost doesn't exist anymore. And so, you know, when you're eating on the run, all you're doing is kind of like wolfing it down and your your body is not able to process it for what it, it is and it's not able to nourish you. Whereas like even if, you know, and when we're ravenous, right, when we get to that point where we're ravenous, we're also not eating in a way that is mindful or intentional. And, and it doesn't take that much to be able to plan in a way that you can eat to nourish yourself. One of my favorite supplement companies is Seeking Health. This company was created by Dr. Ben Lynch, author of Dirty Jeans. I'm a huge fan. And one of the products that I love so much that he's created is this liquid vitamin D. My body has a hard time breaking down supplements. So I love the flexibility of having liquid vitamins. And I started this product a few weeks ago. I went to get my vitamin D tested and it had gone up significantly. So I was thrilled with the results. And use the code ENOSAPRIL22 for 10% off your order. Thank you for joining me today on the Why Did I Get Cancer podcast. I've got my shopping guide for all of my cancer self-care items in the show notes, along with information about today's guest and our show sponsors. And don't forget to subscribe to my podcast so you never miss an episode. Keep in mind, I'm not a doctor. I'm just a gal that got diagnosed with cancer and wanted answers. If you need medical advice, please be sure to consult with a medical professional. And thank you for listening.